Now. Uh, this is Robert Hunter, and you're watching the Break It Down show. Let's just start with the simple question. We have this whole thing going on with Israel and Hamas, and folks want to know, did Iran fund this thing? Well, uh, to begin with, let me say a little preliminary thing. Okay. Uh, this is a time of great emotion for everybody. Right. And uh, there are a lot of fixed views, and there are a lot of people who have attitudes. They may know what they're doing, may not know what they're doing. Maybe I know some of it, maybe I don't. So one has to be a little more careful than one might do because of the unfolding tragedy. The number of people have been killed on the Israeli side, more than 1,300. The number of people being killed in Gaza, we probably don't know the exact number, but uh, it's a good deal likely it's more. And as Israel steps up its attacks uh, in Gaza, and is saying it's going to do, uh, there will undoubtedly be a number of uh, civilian casualties. And there is a competition, that's maybe the wrong word, uh, of people in terms of the relative amount of sorrow, sense of tragedy, sense of anger. So one has to be, I think, a little careful, a little precise, uh, as one one can. The idea that, that Iran fund this, I mean, the short answer is uh, probably not. Uh, most of the funding for, insofar as we know, for Hamas has come from uh, particularly uh, uh, some of the Gulf Arab states, uh, maybe some from the Iranians, but the Iranian connection into the conflict with Iran, with uh, Israel, sorry, is primarily through Hezbollah, which is in Lebanon, and the Iranian connection with Hamas is secondary. Uh, among other things, Hezbollah is Shia, and Hamas is Sunni. Uh, so that, uh, and also, for the Iranians, the extent they want to be involved, it's far easier to arm and uh, influence Hezbollah in Lebanon with, in effect, open borders than to do the same thing in uh, Gaza, where one of the remarkable things, as everybody's reflecting on it, is how, with closed borders, uh, uh, did uh, Hamas manage to put together what it did not just in terms of digging tunnels, uh, that sort of thing, you can do that with a, with a shovel and an ax, uh, but uh, all the various weaponry that they managed to come up with, a lot of which uh, I suspect is clear uh, they didn't make. So short answer, this is not primarily an Iranian problem. Now, one of the things by the Biden administration, and there are several objectives involved, one of them is to try to keep the war from expanding. Right. Because already we were in a circumstance with the Iranian nuclear program, we'll talk about that later, where uh, I think the administration mishandled it, just as Trump mishandled it, uh, with the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action of 2015, which in effect got Iran out of the nuclear war business. And then Trump quit it, and Biden refused to rejoin it, Okay. both with a lot of support from Israel to do what the United States did. But the United States doesn't want to expand it. Now, what's happening between Israel and Hezbollah, in which there have been attacks across the border, uh, who initiated it? I don't know. Maybe we'll never know. Uh, each side is blaming the other, but it's playing with fire. Uh, from the Israeli perspective, and I know it's a long answer to a short question, from the Israeli perspective, a war with Hezbollah is far more problematic because Hezbollah is not only more heavily armed and does have at least one clear foreign sponsor, and that's Iran, but also uh, the number of Israelis, particularly civilians, who are at risk from what Hamas has been doing from uh, uh, from uh, Gaza is small compared to uh, the concentration of the Israeli population, not in the Gaza and the Negev, but in the northern part of the country. So if it came to a war with Hezbollah, um, 
all out uh, how to handle military, I don't don't even know. But certainly, if Hezbollah made a point of it, they could kill a lot more Israelis uh, than uh, uh, Hamas could. If I haven't confused everything on that. But these are one thing I, I, I suspect you want, and this is my best analysis yeah. of the circumstances to the extent uh, with my experience and watching things, listening to media, listening to what people say, and my judgment, to try to give you my best judgment. And I could we, be wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. We, we will be wrong, right? We can, we can talk about what we know from our experience and what we've read. One of the things that's troubling is, uh, and I'll just pick on Iran right now, but we could also pick on the Palestine, the current Palestinian leadership, is the open and and just dangerous position about Israelis, the is Israel's existence, and the talking about nuclear war and eliminating Israel from the face of the earth and the support of Hamas's operations. This. For a person who's working on statecraft, this has to make you rub your head and go, why would the religious leaders and the state leaders from these countries, and I'm using Palestine as a country because most of the world recognizes Palestine as a state. Why? Well, they why don't recognize they, it as a state. They recognize it as a people without a state. I'm saying that most countries around the world recognize Palestine as a state. 130, 160 some odd countries do it. Either way, um, why do these people... state? You got to remember that one of the issues. It's not a state. It's a group of people, and there's the PLA in the West Bank, and there's Hamas and others in uh, in Gaza. But it's not a state. That's one of the big issues here. Okay. Well, when but they get recognized, had, uh, what are they recognizing then? What are these other countries recognizing? These 160 some odd countries. What are they recognizing? Well, the Palestinian rights which include being able to have an independent Palestinian state. And the only country that can confer that is Israel. Uh, there, anybody else can say it, but it doesn't make it real unless the Israel, which is the occupying power, uh, permits it to happen. Now, to go back to what you were just saying about the Iranians, um, in many countries, if not all countries of the world, you've got to take what people say often with a grain of salt. In the Middle East, you got to have a whole bushel of salt with just about everybody. Yeah. The, the Iranians have now positioned themselves uh, for their own purposes uh, to try to curry favor with the so-called Arab street, even though they're not Arabs, right? which is right. clear about that. They're not Arabs. If you ever call an Arab an Iranian or an Iranian an Arab, you're going to have a fist fight, all right? Yeah. And that goes way back to the year six, 640, approximately. It's been around a while. Uh, but the Iranians want to position themselves as the only friend, real friend, they would say, uh, of the Palestinian people, where most of the rest of the, uh, well, in fact, I would say all of the leaderships uh, of other uh, Arab countries couldn't care less, except to the extent they have to worry about their own populations rising up and putting pressure on these governments. And part of what Hamas did was try to bring that back onto the board. And uh, even the, um, the head of the Emir, I guess it is, of the United Arab Republics, uh, UAE, said uh, last week uh, that he's not quite sure he wants to go together with this so-called Abrahamic Accord with, with Israel. Uh, these folks have to worry a lot more uh, than the Saudis do because they have a lot better control over their own populations. But one of the calculations that uh, Mohammed bin Salman is making now in Saudi Arabia is the extent to which he has to pay attention to the so-called Arab street. And is it just now, because it is very active, or down the road will they forget about it? Uh, as to Iran wanting to eliminate uh, uh, Israel, I just I don't take that seriously. I'm not even take it seriously that uh, Hamas wants to get rid of Israel altogether. Who, who knows? Uh, neither has an opportunity to implement it. And yeah. so they, they, they aren't real issues. Now, uh, it is clear that Hamas is highly negative on Israel. And one thing, and I'm sorry, again, I'm jumping ahead here. What were Hamas's motives? 
Well, one is to try to destroy Israel, maybe, but they're in no position to do it. No position to do it. Uh, they just don't have the people power, manpower. They don't have the weaponry. They're relatively small. Uh, their access is not to the population centers of uh, Israel, except almost random attacks, which kill civilians, but in no way would bring uh, Israel in mortal danger or even serious danger. But um, trying to think about why the, what they were doing, they had at least two objectives. Um, well, one, one overriding objective, which was to, to keep the Palestinian issue alive and their role in the Palestinian issue where they're competing with the Palestine Liberation Authority as to who's the best champion for the Palestinians. Okay? And they could see as Israel looked like with US support, working with the Saudis to put the last piece, major piece of the so-called, the ones that matter, of the so-called Abrahamic Accords together, uh, that is Israel with Saudi Arabia, if, as the key decision maker, MBS, as you know, Mohammed bin Salman would say, look, I can accept that Israel won't do very much for Palestinians, and I can handle that with the Arab Street, mm -hmm. but this buys me a lot of stuff. In particular, it buys me getting out of a uh, getting out of jail card with American public opinion over the slaughter of uh, Mr. Khashoggi five years ago uh, when they killed him as the consulate in Istanbul and dismembered his body. Yeah. And it was laid at the feet of MBS and his people. Uh, number one, they are insisting that they get the right to do uranium enrichment in Saudi Arabia provided by Uncle Sugar by the United States. Uh, also, that they would get a some kind of security commitment from the United States, uh, not exactly like NATO's, which is an absolute commitment to go to war for Saudi Arabia for or attack, but something a lot more close, a lot closer than exists today. And third, to get even more infusion of American really high tech weaponry. Now, in the Congress. And in the administration is saying, hey, no, no, wait a second, wait a second. Uh, particularly uh, the idea of getting a closer military relationship as a security agreement, commitment, we're not so sure we want to go there or that we could get the Congress to go there. If we were a treaty, the Congress would never, never back it okay? uh, because the Israelis wouldn't be like it. And in terms of an open spigot on arms, that would include a lot of high tech weaponry that scares the Dickens out of the Israelis. They have always worried about Saudi Arabia, the potentially, now that Egypt is taken out of the balance on the Camp David Accords a long time ago, the one they worry about is Saudi Arabia. And if they get all this high tech stuff that in theory would be used against Iran, but could also use about Israel, they'd worry about it. Incidentally, um, the Persian Gulf now, at least on the Arab side, is so weighted down with military. Mm. I don't even know where they put the rest of it. Somebody said one of the remarkable things, these countries haven't sunk into the sea. Yeah. And Iran is a second rate military power. It may be a first rate power in terms of, of pushing out some terrorism, a first rate power in terms of working with Hezbollah, second rate power of the God Hamas, but not, not a nothing. But in military terms, there is no military balance in the Persian Gulf. Uh, Iran is not in the game. And why Saudi wants all this stuff, I have no idea. But uh, uh, they want to be our buddy and want to be dominate. Now, for the Israelis, uh, they have wanted two things out of the relationship for the last period while this thing negotiation is going on. Nobody says this. You have to infer it from what people do and look at their interests and behavior over the years. For the Israelis, really don't want an independent Palestinian state, period. Uh, 
people are talking about it. The president of the United States is talking about it again. Others are. Uh, and there are a lot of Israelis would be comfortable with it. But nobody who's serious who would be in government. The last time that happened was under Yitzhak uh, Rabin back in 1994, following up on a thing called the Oslo Accords, which happened in 73. Uh, and then he was shot and killed by a right-wing Israeli fanatic. People have always speculated what happened to Rabin's uh, security people and all that. But anyway, uh, the Israelis want this last piece of Abrahamic Accords so they can then say, that takes care of the Palestinian problem. We don't have to do a damn thing. And a lot of Israelis would like to. I, there's an old thing which... I think may still be true, used to be. Uh, this week it's not true because of the feelings there are now. Yeah. It, uh, that if you had a secret vote among Israelis and Palestinians on the West Bank, you'd probably get 70% of the people saying, come on, let's get this over with. Independent Palestinian state, America will provide us with security, then we'll, we'll get on with normalized relationship. But that's not the way the governments work. Uh, not the way the Palestinian Authority works with this aged guy, uh, Mahmoud Abbas, who's always looking over his shoulder at uh, Hamas, among other things. Yeah. And it's not true of people who governed in Israel. And it just didn't just begin with Netanyahu, though the internal Israeli politics are such, as you know, he wants to change the judiciary. Uh, so the judiciary will have diff different kind of rules, and then they can give him uh, a free pass on being tried for corruption. Mm. So I don't know what would happen if they had a, actually had a trial of Netanyahu, but he's sufficiently worried about being convicted of corruption. That That's one major reason why he's been screwing around with the uh, uh, trying to change the uh, Supreme Court, which produced a reaction in Israel weekend after weekend, which they'd never before seen in their history. And incidentally, it's the only one thing that President Biden has tried to get uh, Netanyahu to change. He hadn't tried to get him to change anything else, as, as Trump didn't as well. And the other thing that uh, the Israelis would like to get out of the Abrahamic Accords is they know that they would be able to turn to us and say, this reiterates the requirement of keeping Iran from getting the bomb, but it also means that nobody's going to have to work with Iran to uh, uh, to see if it could be uh, uh, reintegrated in the outside world. It's a twofer for Israel, at least for the current government. Mm -hmm. um, and if you watch the media, you see this every, every day. Now, one of the things I worry about, there is this line that's put out, going on back all the way to the original question, Iran was behind this. Iran would love to attack us, etc. Maybe it's true. But it's, it's being said out of Israel, not because necessarily they believe it, but it's a way in our politics, an added bit of insurance of tying American public opinion into Israel. Yeah. That's what they're doing it for. Now, if I were an Israeli in Netanyahu's position, I might do the same thing. Whether that's good for my country is something we could debate. Yeah. So that was the, and I suspect one reason for what, uh, at least the timing that uh, maybe I'm repeating myself, uh, what Hamas did is said, hey, wait a second. If that goes forward, uh, we're toast. We, all of us, all the Palestinians are now toast. Who's going to pay the slightest attention to us? Because the Arabs couldn't care less. And if the Arab street isn't there, yeah. And, uh, Israel just says, well, Palestinians, who are they? Go back to what Golda Meir said. Palestinians, that's not a people. She wants yeah. that. It's, uh, it all this is tied together. All this is tied together. Which is why you should never want to get into the Arab Israeli business, except for one thing. And this is this week, it's probably very bad humor. But I used to say it's a Sermon on the Mount in regard to Arab Israeli. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall never be unemployed. <laughs> and the other thing about this one, if you get into this business, it's going to be a lifetime occupation. 
I've been working on these issues now. Oh my God. Since the 6th of June, 1967. That's 56 years. Wow. And uh, yeah, I could solve it. I could, if you, if you let me pound some heads together, I I could solve it in three days, which is to go to the so-called, get in if you want, the so-called Clinton parameters of mm-hmm. December 23rd, uh, 2000, 2000s, if before I left office. You read that document, every serious expert in the business who's not grinding an ax would look at that and say, that's the answer. We'll give through the details, but it's on the internet. I invite your people just go on the internet and ask for the Clinton parameters. It's three pages. Yeah. Read it. It's all there. Let me. I'm going to get back to that, but let me go back in time a little bit. And and I don't know how uh, much you follow X or Twitter, but um, and I'm pulling right now. I'm reading directly from uh, the religious leader from Iran's uh, X feed. And so just just an example. And he's he's like he's obsessed. The Zionist regime is dying. This is October 3rd. The usurper regime is coming to an end today. The Palestinian youth, the anti-oppression, blah, 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 on and on and on. And then on the 7th, the day, um, uh, he just, again, the uh, Zionist regime is dying. It's on the 3rd, over and over again. On the 7th, he talks about the Palestinian youth and Palestinian movement is more energetic and alive, more prepared than it's ever been in the last 80 years. And then you have to open up because uh, this, the one from the 10th is uh, blocked because it shows a bunch of terrorized kids running away from this uh, concert that they were at, God willing. This is the a religious leader of Iran, God willing, the cancer of the usurper Zionist regime will be eradicated at the hands of the Palestinian people and the resistance forces throughout the region as the Hamas uh, forces are paragliding into a peace, con- peace concert. And then it just goes on and on and on. So again, like when, and, and look, um, the Palestinian heads of state on their Twitter feed, same kinds of things, right? So when you're trying to put bang their heads together, the first thing I would say is like, get off Twitter. Stop, stop saying these things in the open because if I'm Israel, I'm going to believe you now. I'm going to believe you. And and uh, if you're saying things, and they've said, Ahmed, and all these guys have said horrible things openly for years. How do you get Israel to say, yeah, they're just running their mouths, right? Like at some point you have to say, well, you know what? They... Israel has their hawks, you know this, and the doves have tried, but now the hawks are like, see, we've been telling you, we've been telling you, and now the hawks are going to go out and and fly around and and tear some heads off. So when you're trying to put folks together in the room as a statesman, someone who's trying to get reason to balance things out, I don't know how you, how do you get the rhetoric to stop? Because I, I know people that when when um when President Trump said no we're going to move our um, embassy to Jerusalem they said you know Palestine uh, the capital of Palestine is Jerusalem and, and, and it's also the capital of Israel you know and they cannot handle it there's a real there's a real uh, I'll call it an inculcation where these two things cannot exist together and I don't I just don't know what we do about that at the state level where we can get the two sides to want to cooperate and stay cooperating. Um, I, I want to bring in Clinton back into this too, in this conversation, because I was, Roger Clinton is my friend. I've been to us, he's had his house this summer, and we were talking about his brother and his legacy and how powerful um, of a figure he has remained. You know, Despite all the stuff during his presidency that people talk about, he is one of the presidents that people call when there's a problem. And they get on the phone and they're like, Hey, Bill, help us settle this, help us figure. And he stays busy working because he has that kind of respect. He has that ability to negotiate. So uh, I'd like to get your thoughts on why is that the case all these years later? Because now it's been quite a bit of time. But how do you get these cooler heads to prevail? How do you get these guys to stay off of Twitter and stop saying this stuff that is driving people crazy? Well, you've you've raised about eight or nine problems in there if I want to <laughs> unpack it. Um, my hope is that people keep their mouth shut. Yeah. You know, and I know, and the Israelis know, that short of energizing Hezbollah to kill a lot of Israelis in northern Israel or Iran doing something else, 
Yeah. Uh, they're not in a position to destroy Israel. Right. They just aren't. Uh, and a lot of what they're saying is for effect with the uh, effect with the uh, Arab street and also for their own uh, public opinion to an extent, uh, though their public opinion would be uh, would be uh, divided on it. I would guess that the one issue on which the Iranian clerics really care is really care in their hearts is not the Palestinian issue. It's a question of Jerusalem, okay? Because that's a that's a Muslim issue, not an Arab issue. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say something which uh, is going to sound bizarre. Of all the issues between Israel and the Palestinians, in my judgment, my experience, the easiest one to solve is Jerusalem. You mm-hmm. can do it at the end. And uh, there was a mayor of Jerusalem a long time ago. 40 years ago, named Teddy Kalik, who had extraordinary, he was a Jew, but had tremendous relations with the Palestinians that he was working with. And what you do, and this was this has been discussed many times, is uh, you keep Jerusalem as one city, as the Israelis say, the internal, eternal capital of Israel. Fine. But it can also be the capital of a Palestinian state. Then you get down to the religious sites, and what you do there is that uh, is that the uh, I've lost you. Do you. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, something intruded here. Um, the top you have the Temple Mount from the Second Temple, perhaps probably the holiest shrine in Judaism on top of which, called the Temple Mount by the Jews, or the Haram el-Sharif uh, by Muslims, mm-hmm. literally on top. Uh, and uh, But if you divided it up, so to go back to work, which has been a policy of uh, Orthodox Jews, and sometimes also the government, no, according to Jewish orthodoxy, no Jew is supposed to go up on the Temple Mount, not full stop, because there is a risk of stepping on where the altar would have been under the second temple way back. Right. Right. In right. fact, they have a rule against it uh, the, when the Israeli government's try to control us, but it's not our fault. So you could work this out. The religious leaders could work that out. And if they were let off in a meeting at a corner somewhere, they could work out in half an hour. Well, maybe for lunch breaks or something like that. Uh, question, well, but what about the Christians? Uh, the Christians have a certain equities too. Back in 1888 at the uh, Conference of Berlin, because there were so many Christians fighting over the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, they came up with a regime for five different Christian sects being allowed to do, somebody's allowed to wash the, the stone where Christ supposedly was, his body was cleaned afterwards. Somebody can do this, somebody can do that, somebody of the five. And one of sex actually lives on the roof. And then because they, they didn't trust any of the Christians, they gave the key to the Holy Sepulcher to a Muslim. And the key has been held by the that family ever since, the key to the door of the Holy Sepulcher. Okay. So the Christians also have, have a look in. But I don't want to get too far into that. But on my personal mm-hmm. judgment, if you get everything else worked out, the folks on the spot, can work out the Jerusalem question. Within that framework, it's one city, capital for two countries. Who cares? Right. Uh, as long as neither one has, as long as you know, the Israelis probably care more about it because in the period between 1948 and the Six-Day War of 1967, Jews were not allowed to go to the Western Wall to pray. They weren't allowed to. And after that, uh, Muslims are allowed to do it, provided they go through a rigmarole as to whose passport gets stamped and whether they go through. Boy, and a lot, of, a lot of uh, Muslims won't because that seeds of sovereignty to the Israeli. You know, another old-fashioned joke is one of the problems with Jewish culture and Palestinian culture, they both produce too many lawyers. 
And they, they haggle about these things. But that doesn't, yeah. help us with where we are, doesn't help us where we are now. So I don't take seriously the capacity of the Iranians to do something serious to the Israelis unless things on the northern border of Israel with Hezbollah get out of control. And I doubt that Iran wants that to get out of control. And right. Hezbollah probably doesn't want it out of control. Because as much damage as they would do in Israel, they would get smashed. They would. Smashed. That's they true. Would smashed. A lot of them would, a lot of them would die. But the Iranians, like some others, can't keep their damn mouth shut. <laughs> and I, on the Israeli side, it is perfectly natural for them to say, and I'd be surprised if they said anything else, look what these guys are saying. Yeah. How can we possibly trust them? Come on, give me a break. And that has just become a complicating factor. And when people are hurting the way people are in Israel now, to have that come in makes them hurt even more. Yeah. Now, we haven't even talked about the hurt on the part of Palestinians in uh, Gaza. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's one reason it's so tragic is the civilians yeah. of both sides are getting screwed. I want to say this real quick and slide this in because what you talked about earlier with the stamping, this it, it's been complex for a long time. My folks in the 80s went to the Holy Land and toured all around there. And you had to be careful about where you got your passport stamped because it might get you hemmed up in terms of your travel. And so if you were going to go from Israel to Jordan, Israel had to slide a temporary card and stamp that so you could peel that out and then go to Jordan without getting hassled. This is in my lifetime. And That's correct. It, so and this whole fact, is, yeah. Uh, the Israelis had a special little thing. If you were on your blue, blue, whatever color it is now, uh, yeah. tourist passport, you can go to Israel and you can say, please just stamp your visa on a piece of paper, which you then right. hide when you go over to Jordan. And when you cross the bridge into Jordan, over the Jordan River, which is a trickle at that point, and one side of the bridge is called the Allenby Bridge, going back to 1918. And the other side of the bridge is called the Hussein Bridge, after King Hussein. Okay? That's right. But if you cross that bridge, and that probably still true now, but maybe not because you know how this agreement, you know how this peace treaty between Jordan and Israel. Right. If you showed up, cross that bridge, and the Jordanian passport guy said, where are you coming from? If you said, I'm coming from Israel, they'd throw you out. Nope. But if you said, I'm coming from Lebanon, no problem. Yeah. All right. And but for the United States government, because it was always critical for the Israelis to be recognized by the United States government, if you came in with the red official passport or the black diplomatic passport, they would insist on stamping the passport. So there could be no question the United States government was recognizing Israel. All right. So what does the United States do? I don't know if they still do it, is you get a separate passport. Hmm. When I worked for Ted Kennedy, and uh, I think it was also true when I was in the White House for Carter, you'd have two passports. One would be good for the whole world, including Israel. And the other was, <laughs> sorry, not Israel, yeah. the whole world. And the other one was good for Israel and then South Africa. Yeah, yeah. Time. So you'd yeah. have the two passports. And everybody understood what the game was going on. But the legalisms are very, very important for people yeah. whose lives depend upon it. And if you, you also could say, I'm coming from the occupied West Bank. And they're like, yeah, you can come in. <laughs> didn't I'm say not Israel. Sure. I, I'm not so sure whether that's true or not. But uh, yeah, that's what they that was what the they... occupation was not recognized as, yeah. as legitimate, I suspect. That would have caused a problem. What were these? <laughs> I haven't been there for several years now. Yeah, and I've I've, I've never been to that bridge. part of that that, that part bridge. of uh, Israel so, and Jordan. So I've never been there. Let's get back to why is uh, President Clinton still relevant? Why are his policies still relevant? I I know you worked for the what, what is still relevant? Yeah. I'm sorry, what's still relevant? Why President Clinton, in terms of like, why does he still get called? Why is he still flying all over the world and trying to resolve problems? Why is he the guy that people call still? 
Why does President Clinton still try to solve problems? Why is he being called? You know, like when I was talking to Roger, it's like, yeah, people call Bill all the time. He's always dealing with things, you know, these various crises. He's still a person that people call to sort problems out, right? He has a knack for this. What is it about his personality that makes him someone that you call when you have to sort out a dispute? Because Jimmy Carter is on his deathbed, practically, and Governor Richardson former UN ambassador, just died. So who's the yeah. next best thing? Bill Clinton. Uh, and why not? Yeah. Former yeah. presidents have a lot of, of cachet, particularly when in issues in which the United States can be seen as an honest broker. Mm. That, of course, in this issue is always has long been a problem, Right. which is, do the Palestinians see the United States as an honest broker, when so often the perception is that the United States favors Israel uh, in terms of what they want to do. Uh, Trump, for example, who had a different aspect of the Israel lobby he was responding to, uh, accepted Israel's sovereignty over Golan Heights, moving the embassy to Jerusalem, in effect saying this is the Israel, is Israel's capital. And for Palestinians and other Muslims are saying, oh, hold on a second, that takes something away from us. I'll let them debate that. Yeah. And then under uh, Biden, except for his engagement in trying to get Netanyahu not to do what he was doing with regard to the Supreme Court because of the threat to the internal structure of Israel and its claims to be a democracy, et cetera, et cetera, which is important for a lot of Americans, uh, for Israel not to do an injury to itself like that, uh, Biden has let Netanyahu do whatever he wants. Uh, some of us said on the Iranian thing, when the 2015 Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action put Iran for a decade out of the nuclear business, and then that gives you time to do something else, uh, Trump got out of it. I think in probably two reasons, three reasons why he wasn't figuring these things out, but cogently, number one, it was something done by Obama, so I want to get rid yes. of it. And secondly, he had his end of days people, uh, the right wing Christians, if they are Christians, I'm not so sure they are. And that was part of his constituency. Mm. And you know, the old idea that they get out of the book of Revelations, that and this is another one, you know, it's always this gallows humor that comes up with this particular thing. Uh, the idea of this crowd of people who I personally don't recognize as Christians, being a centrist Christian myself, if there is such a thing, that is one has to look at it in political terms. The idea right. is that when the second coming of the Messiah, then all the Jews, you know, there's the ingathering in Jerusalem, and then the Jews get a choice either to go with the, the second coming or they get killed. Right. And the Israelis said, we can risk it. Okay, that's the gallows humor. Okay. And then Biden came in saying he was going to get back into the JCPOA, but then didn't do it. I said, many, many of my friends have said, just do it. Instead, they got into these negotiation process, which has been a bunch of kabuki. Uh, mm. At any moment, Biden could have just said, I'm going to rejoin. I'm just undoing what Trump did. He just doesn't do it. And ironically, it was Obama's single most important foreign policy achievement. So Biden, in effect, has stiffed Obama. But he yeah. did it because of his part of the Israel lobby. Okay. But it, it hadn't made any sense. And it's complicated things because we've lost all this time of maybe, 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 who knows? at least trying with the Iranians, and there's been further imposition of sanctions, and uh, which is, frank, frankly, a great help to the Ayatollah and his gang. Mm. They love it. And there was this thing, I don't even know where it came down, about uh, there was this deal. Uh, the Iranians were holding five American hostages. And the South Koreans had $6 billion of Iranian money. And the deal we worked out was that 
the hostages would be turned over to the Qataris and the money would be turned over to the Qataris. We'd get our people back and then the money would go to uh, back to Iran. It was Iranian money, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, but it would only be done for humanitarian purposes. Mm. So in effect, it wouldn't violate the larger sanction thing, which is to try to change the regime, which is nonsense, of course, nonsense. Uh, sanctions really don't work, except very, very rarely. It might have worked to get the Iranians into the JCPOA, but if you look what's happening with Russia, it's having no impact at all. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps Putin. But that's another matter. It's a sanctions are a feel good thing for domestic politics. Yeah. It's yeah. A very cynical thing that we and some other, but particularly we do. We just do it so many places. When you have a problem, come up with sanctions. Big deal. I don't know that the, it's everybody a good policy because I don't I'm think sorry, anybody. It's, it's a very cynical thing. Yeah. Uh, so the, the thing was, I don't know where it came out, that last week, Janet Yellen, the Secretary of the Treasury, stopped the transfer of monies to Iran that had already been agreed. I saw a report that maybe that maybe we reversed our position since then, but. Uh, and I could understand doing it for emotional reasons to show the Israelis we weren't doing anything for Iran, even though it was completing a deal that we had struck. Mm. Well, down the road, it says to the Iranians, you can't trust America. Well, I don't know where that came out. I'd have to look it up whether it did. Uh, next question. Next. Another, one thing I recommend to people. If you really want to understand this, you got to get involved in the history. Oh, boy. Yes. History matters. I have an old line that if you go back to about 1890, the foundation of the Zionist movement, etc., and the beginning of serious uh, Jewish migration into the Holy Land, there were always Jews. Some, there were some Jews were there forever. I have a very good friend whose great grandfather was postmaster under the Ottomans in the Jewish quarter hmm. back in the 1850s. Okay, all the way up to, let's say, date six months ago. You tell me, choose any date as the start of history, and I'll tell you who's right and who's wrong. Yeah. If you want to shift that by one year, you might come up with a different answer. Yep. And everybody out there knows the history. And I used to, I used to again, black humor, say, in the period from, let's say, the creation of Israel to, let's say, the 1990 or 2000s, about 2,000 incidents. Everybody agrees on the 2,000 incidents, but there's, a, but there's at least two variations about what they mean, which makes it so That's hard so for all these lawyers. Yeah. But these are very deep issues. These are issues yeah. about how people live, how they how they believe. Um, and of course, the very, very special factor that we relate to is the Holocaust and what happened to the Jews in Second World War. Yeah. And uh, Israel was to be a homeland for Jews, uh, whether they did the things uh, that would have been wise in regard to the Palestinians after 1967 war, when they occupied the uh, uh, the West Bank in a war that was started by Egypt, incidentally, okay? uh, or at least provoked by Egypt. Uh, some question about who actually started it, but that's another matter. Uh, at the time, when I wrote about it at the time, they got so close to Israel with their troops deployed, the Israelis could not wait to strike second. Okay? Hmm. So they struck first, all right? Perfectly understandable. Uh, so people have to understand the history. Look at the history. Understand the key items. If you want to be in the game. Yeah. I remember the first time I went out there in 1968, 69, and went to Egypt and went to all the countries around. And the Israelis said, you're welcome to go everywhere as long as we get you last. Okay, so we can deal with whatever you've been told in the Arab countries. Very smart. So I first went and I, when I got to Egypt and I went into the presidential palace and I met with one of, yeah, Nasser was still alive, one of his top people. 
And the first thing he did is he started talking to me about the terrible things that Israel had done in 48 and 49. And in effect, I realized he was putting me through the catechism. Mm. And when he mm -hmm. realized I knew the catechism, they couldn't just pull the wool over my eyes, even though I was quite young then. And But I'd done all the study for the work I was doing on at the Institute for Strategic Studies. After 45 minutes, he said, right. I'd passed the catechism. He couldn't pull the wool over my eyes. And we had a great conversation. But that's what they what what uh, what happens. And the Israelis are not stupid. You can go anywhere as long as you come to us last. That's right. And that's gone that's right. on year after year after year. But right now yeah. we're at a deadly pass. Yeah. We've had yeah. more than thirteen hundred Israelis killed. Uh, the most civilians in all of Israel's history. Um, the Six Day War cost 675 Israeli lives, mostly military. Mm -hmm. The Yom Kippur War cost, I think, I'd have to look it up, 2,200 lives, mostly military. So these 1,300 civilians, including some utter brutality, animal like brutality, uh, like Russians do against Ukrainians, etc., you can't wish that away. Right. Nor can you wish away what has already begun to happen in Gaza, in which, depending on what Israel now does, uh, could be horrendous. Even the idea of trying to move half the population out of harm's way, that's, that's just, that can't be done. And one thing that Biden and Blinken have been trying to do is to say to the Israelis, and you listen to what they're actually saying, listen very carefully, that I, I give full marks to the handling of this by Biden, except for some of his rhetoric. But but what they're actually doing is, if you have to go in and destroy Hamas, be very careful how you do it. And it's not just a concern for human lives. It's also because if you, Israel, go in there and kill X hundred or X thousand civilians, you're going to be pariahs for a long time. And you don't want that. Yeah. And we want to help you keep that from happening. That would be a reason for, we now see, uh, the president's very likely to go to Israel soon and to Egypt soon. We can get into the whole situation about what the Egyptians are doing now uh, or not doing now. Uh, but it's to try to get some kind of saying, okay, you, we have your back. We're sending you all this stuff which poor Mr. Zelensky up in Ukraine says, hey, wait a second, I was <laughs> supposed to get a lot of that stuff. I mean, that's just the tragedy of these things, tragedy of these mm -hmm. things. Uh, and you may notice on the American media, you, Ukraine's disappeared. Who? Right? It's gone. Because there was something yeah. for the American psyche. Support for Israel goes to the American psyche. 90% of Americans, on some high percentage of Americans, feel a kinship to Israel by the nature of the society and all of why. One reason Biden was worried about changing the Supreme Court, the nature of the society. But most Americans still don't know where Ukraine is. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. They're prepared to do something as long as we don't get into war with it. Now, uh, dilemma for the United States. Uh, we have now moved two aircraft carrier task forces to the Eastern Mediterranean. These have zero value, except to reassure the Israelis that we really care for them, okay? And to be there as, quote, deterrent, they say, which is to, in case the Iranians did think they want to do something stupid, or Hezbollah decided they wanted to do something stupid. Uh, even then, I don't know, how would people in this country feel? How would people in Congress feel, particularly when the out party right now doesn't like anything Biden right. does, okay? Yeah. Would we really support the United States air, airplanes off an aircraft carrier getting involved directly in this fight? No. It's not at all clear. I think one thing that the, those aircraft carriers do is it uh, it it helps to de-escalate in theory, you know, because like, hey, pay attention. We've You've got our full attention now. 
And so everybody better knock it off, you know, fair enough. calm down. Okay, fair enough. Know? That's the thing. It shows we're here. Yep. We're here. It's a visible symbol of the United States being here. Right. Even though right. you never launch an airplane. Okay. Yeah. And and, and also thing, uh, you get all of our important. intel capability. Well, we're you know? very careful also as well not to get crosswide with Israel. And people remember in 1967 when the Israelis bombed an American intel ship called the Liberty killed yeah. 37 American sailors when they knew perfectly well it was a U.S. ship. Yeah. And the survivors of the Liberty are still trying to get justice on that. Okay. Yeah. The Johnson administration said, uh-uh, I'm not going to touch that. I'm not going to yeah. touch it. Because sometimes you don't want to have to know what's really happening. For example, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions before we run out of time because the, I think these are people people want to know these. And, and again, I'm asking you because you know you know how to broker these deals, so we need to get some of these folks. Yeah, we need to get some of these folks uh, out of the way, right? Egypt is saying no chance, and the Sinai, as you and I both know, is a whole lot of nothing out there. I don't I don't see why. Look, if soldiers can live out in carpet tents out there, I don't see why we can't put some some folks from you know from uh, from Gaza, the Gazans. I don't see why we can't put them out there temporarily, and uh, and let the fighting happen. Um, so, if we're sending all these American assets there, why aren't we uh, working out a deal with the Egyptians? Where like, hey, just just in the Sinai, we're just going to have these guys temporarily. You have our word. We're going to get these guys out of here. And um, how long does this go on? How long? How long until? We start building off ramps and we get this thing turned off before it does get out of hand. Maybe it's happening know. now. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Tony Blinken has given press conference and has very deftly said nothing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. I hope when he saw El Sisi in Egypt saying in a very in his very nice way, he's a very nice guy. Uh, a message from the president. We have a very strong relationship with you, and we want it to continue. Now, what we would like you to do is let some folks get out of Gaza, beginning with American citizens, okay? Yeah. Okay. We hope you get the message that you will do it. Now, why why don't they do it? For a number, number of reasons. One, once the Egypt-Israel peace treaty was done, and we moved over to trying to do something for the Palestinians, as per the Camp David Accords, the Egyptians really didn't want to do anything for the Palestinians. Come on, we don't. What, why should we? Why should we bother? Why should we bother yeah. that? And also, uh, a, a lot of the people involved with Hamas and everything. Remember the religious thing have tended to be Muslim Brotherhood, who are the enemies of the people in Cairo. And also, there's a question: if you allow people to come out. Who should do the vetting of who, who you just brought out? Are these yeah. Hamas people are getting out, waiting for Israel to do the damage and then come back again? They're just asylum seekers. No. They're just asylum seekers. All right, I'm going to tell you a story, which is it's in my memoirs already, but I don't think yeah. anybody else knows this. In 1980, when we were doing the so-called autonomy talks between Egypt, the United States, and Israel, no Palestinians, except in the Egyptian delegation, we didn't check passports at the door. Mm. If there were Palestinians there, how could we tell? We don't check the passport. Right. But it, there was a meeting in the State Department with Moshe Dayan, the famous Moshe Dayan, who was then foreign minister of Israel, and his Egyptian counterpart, and me and about two other Americans, and this one having a cup of coffee in between. And Diane said the following to the Egyptian, we would like to give Gaza back to you. Okay? And the Egyptian said, no way, Jose. You got it. You got to deal with it. Mm. Because the Egyptians didn't want to deal with it. They didn't want, it. They didn't want to have to deal with any Palestinians. So uh, I hope Lincoln has been making that point to Egypt because if we go farther on, and people are getting killed, and we're not getting the Americans out, and they can't get into Egypt, and foodstuffs and stuff can't get back into this. And I think a lot of people are going to change their attitude about Egypt here, and they yeah. don't have a lobby here to support them. They don't. Yeah. Now, 
for for Biden as well, the real, as I say, the real thing is to support Israel in getting rid of Hamas. And as the president said, and as Blinken has said, it's not what you're going to do, it's how you do it. Mm. it Will we give him a treat? Because he's barking loud. Will we give him a treat, your dog? Give him a treat. Give him what? A treat. So he, because you're saying important stuff, but I don't want to miss it. No, what, I, what I'm saying is, your dog. Yeah. Will you give your Maybe dog a treat? Do what you want to do to Hamas, but how you do it matters. That is, I don't see. I'm not a military guy. I've got a lot of experience, and you don't have yes. to be a military guy to know that trying to move a million people and to go in there with force and not kill civilians. And already there was one convoy of civilians going south, and the Israelis probably by accident attacked this convoy and killed a bunch of civilians. I think it was probably a, a, a accident. Uh, how can you possibly do that without a lot of people getting killed? It's hard, right. it's hard to see that. Hard to yeah. see that. And so every day to try to delay the Israeli attack, the United States is trying to do that. Blinken went back there. I'm sure he made all kinds of pledges, president going, and to talk about, they're already talking about getting the Saudi-Israeli agreement back on track, which I personally think in the short term is a zero. Yeah. And probably also reassuring the Israelis about Iran, because that's a, a rather concern. And then the idea of the president going there, which is reinforces things. But the more we can get the Israelis to delay, maybe there can be some alternative to an all-out ground assault. I don't know. Yeah, maybe. Obviously, the people in the government are wiser than me, much wiser than me, and certainly know more about it than I could ever know. Because outsiders can't advise a government. When you get to this point, outsiders, but out, but out. You can't advise them. I'd love to, but I can't. I've been inside. And when you're in a Red hot crisis. The last thing you want is somebody give it. That's my daughter done it with, with a word of yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's uh, so it's easy. You're saying. I, I hear you saying it's so simple. It's so easy, and uh, it, it's direct. Well, what, uh, all I got to say is that Trump did bad things in this, and Biden let things slide. When you had the Israelis going into Janine, we didn't do anything. This is where I want to expand a little bit. Palestinians were killed by settlers. Yeah. When the uh, when some of the right wingers of the uh, uh, Netanyahu cabinet went up on the Temple Mount, which showed frankly there were bad Jews in terms of orthodoxy, but which just drove folks nuts in the Muslim world, uh, and the fact that nothing was being done to help uh, move. The situation forward so the Palestinians would have something real. Uh, I'm not saying that was responsible for what happened, but uh, I thought three weeks before it happened, I said there's a good chance of another intifada. I didn't know, I didn't believe it. This was was going to be this. I had an idea, right. and nothing justifies it. Just like nothing justifies what Putin did. Yeah, these are horrendous crimes. And one thing Biden's trying to do is for Israel not to create crimes in against civilians in response. Who knows? There's one more part that I want to get into, and I want to expand on what you just you Another, said previously. Uh, and you leapfrog to something later on towards a final settlement. But I don't think that's a, a, that. Remember, between the 73 war and Sadat going to Jerusalem, there was four years in there. Yeah. You can't do this right away. Yeah, yeah. You've been, uh, and I think I agree with you on this, you've been critical of the past presidencies and their ability to do foreign policy. So um, you're not being necessarily critical right now. And I know it's early in the game. Why do I all of a sudden trust these guys? And the other thing is, is the corruption piece doesn't seem to be as big of a problem here in Israel as it is in Ukraine on the surface. But I, you know, from what I've seen in my experience, we, you know, we corrupt things here in America. We just bring a lot of money, right? And so um, I'm always suspect that 
we're going to bring things and it's going to be used in other ways. For example, M4s showing up in the attack that Hamas uh, conducted. I don't know where those M4s came from. I wouldn't want to speculate because I don't have the inside knowledge on that, but I know where M4s, you know, I know what service drives the M4 production. So um, should I be trusting um, this team that has made a lot of foreign policy errors? And uh, what are your thoughts on corruption? Well, I don't know how corruption fits in, though we could talk about it. If you're talking about how weaponry and everything shows up, uh, there is a global arms market. It's a wash in arms. And it's uncontrolled and uncontrollable at this point. We and other countries, the Russians, the French, the British, and some others, have pushed so many arms to so many countries that if you want to buy an arm, uh, I don't know how to do it, but I'm sure I could right. put you in touch with somebody so yeah. you can buy just about anything. Buy just about anything if you wanted. Uh, what I hope is that, from an American perspective, that this team having Trump was just kind of useless. This team has been, to a great extent, asleep at the switch, in part because of other things, in part because of the domestic lobby. You know, why get in trouble when you don't need to? But at this point, need to do, and so far, what I see has basically been positive, need to do the right things in America's interest. And one thing I'd like to see them do is bring in some outside experts, forget about me, I've already blotted my copybook too much, but uh, there are a lot of others I could name who have a lot of experience as negotiators, as a lot of things like this, um, probably a lot more experience and a lot more knowledge than some of the people in the senior levels of the administration. I think the president has an obligation to do that. 1941-42, uh, Pearl Harbor, Roosevelt then reached out and got the best people he could. Beginning of the Cold War, Truman and Eisenhower got out, reached out and got the best people he could. Vietnam, uh, Kennedy had a bunch of people who were hawks, gets killed. Johnson, in order to have continuity, kept them all on. They drove the United States into Vietnam. They were the ones that did it. Every single senior official in the United States government who argued for escalation of Vietnam had been appointed by John Kennedy. Every single one mm. senior people. Well, he did the opposite. So what I hope is that Biden will wake up and say, I've got some good people here. Got some good people here. We need some other people to come in and talk with us and not just the usual suspects. There are an mm. awful lot of people. You look at people on the... Uh, on, on the media, so we're talking an awful lot about it. And so and so was a negotiator back then. A lot of times, uh, they were not exactly neutral in what they were doing when they were in government. And presidents didn't mind because there were a variety of factors. But there are a lot of people out there who are not being listened to who should be. And I hope the president will do that. Not for the day to day, it's too late for that. But in terms yeah. of where do we go down the road beginning two, three, four weeks in months from now? Bring in the people to add experience. Yeah. Do you do it? No, I don't think it's right. Well, either way, they can listen to this show and maybe they'll they get some advice from Robert Hunter and they'll be like, you know, that's a pretty good idea. And then they'll I go from that. I just burned my last bridge to the administration. But I did that a long time ago. <laughs> it's a, you know, because... I'll drag a little bit about me. During the time in which I had senior government responsibility in this area, for two years in the Carter White House, uh, handling these issues okay, directly as part of the negotiating team, and then when I was NATO ambassador and got Israel involved in a special arrangement with NATO, I had the respect of the Israeli side and the Arab side because both of them knew I was not for sale and that I was going to represent American interests. Mm, mm -hmm. and, I, and I would give my best advice. Now, in terms of making money, that was probably a bad choice, but 
you know, like you, I've been around too long. I'm an, I hold an American passport and it's the only loyalty I have to do what's best for the United States. Right, right, right. Yeah. It's like the best way to go, right? And then you end up uh, you end up doing whatever happens, and you know where your compass is. You know you're pointing in the right direction. So I just oh, I just hope at this point the president will. He's already recognized. I got to do some things differently. The situation demands it, but I just hope he would say, the team I brought in does great work on some things, but it needs augmenting, just as Roosevelt. <laughs> augmented his team in yeah. 1941 dwight eisenhower worked on plans in the building was being built depending on what he even built then and he was a brigadier general mm. okay and he ended up with five stars well i'd like to bring in some brigadier generals civilian mostly yeah they can be useful as five stars earn their spurs but i don't think it'll happen Boy, well, yeah that would be uh, that would be something to to really get that level of uh expertise in there right that wouldn't normally get a shot uh anything else in closing before we go i'll go back to where i began this is a terribly emotional period mm. a lot of people on maybe on both sides are going to disagree with what i have to say it's very hard for anybody to be rational about it because people they know, people they care about, are dying and who may die. Oh, I'll just say one thing. One thing I worry about is this conflation of what's happening now with the Holocaust. I can understand people say that. And this is advice I would give people in the Jewish community. I have no standing, but here's my advice that doing that conflation, depending on what the Israelis do later on against civilians, could be a spur to more anti-Semitism than there is now. What is happening essentially, despite what all these people say out there about Jews and that sort, this is basically action against the state of Israel, which just happens to be mostly Jewish. And when you yeah. conflate the two, you're asking, I, I understand why people do it. You're asking for trouble. Mm, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. The thing is this. Hold on. Don't give up your emotions on both sides. Care about the human dimension. Because it's like a lot of conflicts, it's just deeply personal, deeply human, human suffering. These are all other than the military on both sides, are civilians, people. Yeah, no, totally. Mothers, grandmothers, husbands, uncles, children who are dying for no purpose whatsoever. That's right. In some ways, except the gratification of leaders. And so, Ted Kennedy once said, old men make wars for young men to die in. And we, as the sole superpower, have a responsibility to try to break these cycles. Yeah. And this is a place we have to begin. Support Israel, but try to minimize death and destruction on both sides. If we can, if we can. All right, stand by, be right back. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to. Curate.